And we are here live, ready for these premier invitational events. I'm Grandmaster Robert Hess. Alongside me is my good friend, Katerina Nemtseva. Katerina, how are you doing today? Or tonight, I should say, because you're commentating from Prague. Yes, hi, Robert. Hi, everyone. I'm doing very well. I am excited about this, this event. And yes, in, in Prague, I'm in Prague. It's 1 a.m. here, so it's going to be a very exciting commentary. It certainly will. And let's remind all of our viewers what we're about to commentate on because there are many different events throughout the weekend. We are going to start with the Sunil Weirmentary National Blitz Tournament of State Champions. There are going to be three sections. There is a 2200 plus section, 1600 through 2199, and then under 1600. And then there will be the longer time patrol events, the Denker Tournament of High School State Champions, the Ruth Herring Tournament of Girls State Champions, the National Tournament of Senior State Champions, the Dwayne Barber National Tournament of Middle School State Champions and the John D. Rockefeller III National Tournament of Elementary School State Champions. So, Katerina, it's really cool to see an event like this with players of all ages taking part. Yes, absolutely. And I'm especially looking forward to the Girls' Championship, the Ruth Herring Tournament of Girls' State Champions. I think that's going to be exciting to see, you know, how girls are doing uh, in these days. It certainly will. And, you know, of course, the late Ruth Herring was such an important part of U.S. chess and we miss her dearly. And let's uh, remind everybody that you know, tournaments like this, they're made possible through the support of Un the United States Chess uh, Federation and it's a tax deductible donation, 501c3 organization. So please, if you can and are able to uh, donate to US Chess, that would be so welcome and appreciated. And well, Katerina, we are going to have three different tournaments taking place. And in the 2200 plus section, it's a really strong event we have uh, GMs in the field, we have IMs, so I have no idea who is the favorite as I look at the initial seeds there, but it certainly promises to be a tough and very strong event. Absolutely. I think all these players, I mean, they are so strong. And as I talk to a lot of my friends who are strong chess players, a lot of them are excited to finally play some chess, to play some competitive chess, to win. I mean, they're, they've been practicing at home or they are bored at home. Uh, so I think we can look forward to some exciting and fighting chess. We certainly will. And I also want to point out that this is the Weirmentary Blitz event named after Sunil Weirmentary, who is such a positive influence on American chess. He has been a scholastic coach. He's been on the scholastic councils for U.S. chess. He's been helpful in so many different areas with respect to growing chess in the United States. So this tournament is named after Sunil, and we want to thank him for all he has done for the world of chess. And we are just about get ready for liftoff here. I am seeing that the game should start in just under a minute now. Katarina, I mean, it's three minutes plus two second increment. When's the last time you played a Bliss tournament like this? I have not played chess, serious chess for a long time. And Bliss, I play a lot just online, but mm -hmm. last month I've been playing a lot of bullet chess, which is very surprising because I've never played bullet before. Um, yeah, but last 3-2 tournament, I don't know, five years, maybe? Five three years. years, wow. Maybe three years at St. Louis Chess Club. We played their like, club championship or something. Wow, well, it's been too long, and it's certainly been too long since I've seen you because, well, it's been a really long time. But we won't talk about that now. That's uh, What about maybe... you, when you played last time? I played in the Speed Chess Championship Grand Prix events, so those are every Tuesday on chess.com. I take part in those. A lot of fun and many strong players, including the likes of you know Hikaru Nakamura, Ali Reza Perugia, etc. So we do have liftoff, by the way, and we see the first game here from Praveen B, 20, 2002, and Mac Daddy Mac. What a username he has here, and we see a Spanish. So, Katarina, if there are any games that are more interesting to catch your eye, please let me know. I'll let you uh, pick and choose what you mm -hmm. find interesting. But for now, this is the top board, and Praveen actually, I see his name often in the speech of championship grand prix he's very strong he's tends to be towards the top in the later rounds playing against all these strong gms so it's only a matter of time once the world opens up again and the pandemic subsides that he'll become a grandmaster i believe and black is meg daddy mac which is uh sullivan mcconnell so national <laughs> master I don't think I ever would have thought I'd hear you say the words Mac Daddy Mac. <laughs> Just, <laughs> <laughs> I'm glad that uh, this moment happened. But this knight on d5, and just in general, is d5 square. When black puts the pawns in c5 and e5, pawns cannot move backwards, which means that white controls the square. How important do you think that is to the position here? 
I really like the knight on d5. Uh, it's controlling a lot of squares. In future, the knight can go also to e3 and f5. If that's going to be better. Mm -hmm. OK, yeah. not longer, but <laughs> <laughs> it could have been an option. I agree. Um, it, it's funny. You know, anytime you do commentary, especially in a blitz game, you say something, the next moment it's, it's impossible. Doesn't mean that you didn't have a good point. So what Katarina was saying, mm -hmm. the knight coming to e3, eventually the f5 would look good. And how about this capture on b4 here? Because if pawn takes b4, is black trying to take on d5? It doesn't work. I take back with my bishop on d5. And so you're not winning this b4 pawn. I actually do not like this decision to take on b4, as it allows white direct access to the b6 square. Yeah, I think maybe black wanted to play like a5 and crush the queen side, but bishop b6 is a very strong move after a5. Yeah, bishop b6 comes in, hitting the queen, hitting this a5 square at the same time. And this knight on d5 is still such a thorn that black has to deal with. So I'm really liking white's position. It's about even the clock, capturing on d5. You cannot take on b4 yet. The bishop on b7 was hanging. That's why queen c7 was played. But now white can just play queen to d2, for instance, protecting the b4 pawn and threatening bishop takes h6. And some very, there's queen to d2. So Katarina, I think I move like 98, sadly. Is that what you think? I think 98 looks nice. And if you want to play like bishop take h6, then I first capture on d5. But mm. OK, black wants to play probably knight e7 first. Yeah, it's tough to play a move like knight to d8 just because it feels a little bit passive. But bishop f6, the bishop looks like a big pawn there, doesn't it? So maybe to play rook c1 with c4. Oh, you're getting all aggressive here, just trying to blast forward. I mean, that makes sense to me. Which rook? Rook fc1, maybe? Maybe rook fc1. And maybe white like... will go knight h2, knight g4. Aha, uh -huh. going after this bishop. Actually, that bishop is misplaced there. So knight h2, knight g4 looks pretty strong. Rerouting piece and also opens up the f pawn for f4. As you do have a rook on f1 and bishop on d5, which can together aim at the f7 square. So c4 play without rook to c1 mm -hmm. makes sense. It's the idea yeah. that you were suggesting just uh, played right away without the rook getting behind the pawn. Knight e7, that was planned as well, getting rid of the weak bishop on b7. I don't hate black's position. I thought I would but I don't mind it so much. What about you? Do you think that white is just better here or is black doing okay? I really want the white knight to get to g4. And then I think white is very comfortable because h6 would be hanging and a lot of issues coming there. But I can't do it maybe right now because black can take the pawn on c4 and then e4 pawn is hanging. Although what so I always say, Katarina, is these are not our pieces. So if we want to sacrifice mm -hmm. a pawn, we should feel free. So knight h2, b takes c4, knight g4 is a possibility that I'm interested in. <laughs> and who cares if we're down material? It's not our pieces. The rook fc1 was played instead. Oh, come on. Yeah. <laughs> but now you still take, no? Okay, so let's go knight h2. Or I'm, 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 c5. I'm here for Actually, it. let's go c5. Yes. Okay. It was played. And after d takes c5, you're taking back with the pawn or the bishop? Bishop. Okay. And well, d5 was played, saying no bishop takes c5 for you. And d4 is a big threat as it traps this bishop in on e3. Queen slides mm -hmm. to c2. I have to admit, I like this pass pawn on c5. Protected, very safe and sound. And the bishop on f6 is just a horrible piece. And it's interesting that maybe white now wants to play knight d2, knight b3, knight a5. That would Ooh, be funny. Mm -hmm. <laughs> that would actually be really annoying. And just goes to show the queen side pawn structure. It is not symmetrical. And white's pawn is more advanced than c5. So the b5, b4 stare down is important. But the a6 pawn is under attack. It doesn't have a pawn protecting it, while the pawn c5 is protected by its fellow pawn b4. So that has to be good for white. Maybe black will try to play like a5 eventually to undermine the protection of c5. But for now, it's so well defended that it doesn't look like a realistic option. I think black really needs to decide what to do with the bishop on f6. So maybe like knight g6 and bishop d8 and a5 or knight g6, knight f4. Mm -hmm. OK, knight, knight g6 yeah. I think is necessary now. I agree. And d4, I, I don't like this d4 move. Although trading off the bishops is a very mm -hmm. smart strategic decision, this closing of the center here feels like it takes away some of black's important resources. Because now if you're knight f3, you either play queen f6 or pawn f6, as both e5 and g5 are under attack. And then I'm thinking, can I double my rooks in the a file, go straight after this a6 pawn? I play rook a3, rook a1, and queen a2. A queen sandwich in the a file. I mean, going to end game with, when white has the... Pawn on c5, passed pawn. That's very dangerous. So I'd like to play queen b3, but I couldn't do it yet as knight c6 at the end would put pressure on my b4 pawn. So I guess black isn't in tremendous danger just yet. Somehow this knight coming to c6 for black, it will help prevent white from pushing the passed pawn. 
and attack this b4 pawn. But queen d1 says, I'm not trading queens. I'm for sure. I'm trying to get my queen over the king side. I mean, rook, G, rook h8 also makes sense. Maybe playing g6, f5, g4, and just try to do something on the king side. I see you with your aggressive intentions. Maybe knight g6 to f4 first. I don't know how much time black has, but I would prefer to have my knight on f4 if I'm going for the attack. And actually, if he does start with knight to g6, coming to f4. So white does need to be really careful here. I would not allow this knight to f4 as I feel like there's going to be a, a pretty quick checkmating attack, actually. So what does white do here, Katarina? I mean, knight c1. I mean, now I feel like white is a little bit wasting time. Oh, okay, trading queens. That That's kind of solved the trouble with capturing stuff on. It does. That was a, on H3. a very important decision to trade queens, as, as Katarina is saying. The knight takes H3 would have been devastating with queen takes H3 to follow, but the queen cannot take on H3 as it was pinned to the king. So now we see a queen trade and white's more advanced past pawn and now pressure down this A6 pawn. This actually looks really problematic as rook A5 takes on B5 is the threat. Rook C6 to protect A6. Here comes rook A5. You cannot protect this pawn on B5, which is the A6 pawn is pinned to the rook on A8. Yeah, this is very problematic. And white even has time to go king F1, king E1, king D2, and then activate the knight to B3. Yeah. It's just uh, it's a clear pawn being won for white here. And look at the time as well. 13 seconds for black. Knight comes back to C7, but that's a very important pawn. Rook to B6 here probably can be played, but maybe rook B7 is just smarter. And Knight, oh, knight coming to a5. However, this rook on b7 is kind of awkward. So rook b6 now probably sh should be played. Maybe and c6. Okay, rook b6. You're right. Oh, uh, now it's winning b7. Knight c6 check, mm. and he can't stop me from promoting. But capturing on b6 was immediately resulting in a lost position, and this is exactly what we see. So it's uh, going to be a win for Praveen Balakrishnan. Not really too much of a surprise there. He is the high rated player by 400 points, actually, in chess.com ratings. And he's an international master, I believe, with at least one, maybe two grandmaster norms. So a very talented player here. Uh, and Rook F3, nice move. Just making sure that Black doesn't take on D3. Try to go G3, H4. Looks like the pawn's just going to promote Katarina. Yeah, this seems like an easy win now for White. It just does indeed. H4, let's go. Let's go and just h5, right? Just keep pushing that thing. Knight c1, king d1. If you take on d3, king back to e2, your knight's pinned. So <laughs> this knight check, it looked like it was removing a defender of d3, but you can't even capture it when all is said and done. And we see a resignation. So let's move on. There, are what? There's two games left, right? Yes. Nice. So the one is about to finish soon as well. So let's go to the Dahog Dry Country. Okay, I have that one up here. Wow, this is an interesting position. What do you make of this? The queen with the pawn should, of course, be better. But is black? No, not anymore. It's checkmate. Uh-oh. Uh-oh, that's me. Ooh, 97 out of fun. We just take that knight. It was just if white pre-moved uh, queen g8, the, the knight could have to capture it. <laughs> <laughs> that does happen. I must admit that certainly does happen. But that was a sad move to have to play 97 because... Yeah. It looked like black was trying to create a fortress of sorts, the knight on f8 and the rook on d7. But as soon as the knight was uh, was moved, it just resulted in a loss here. And, okay, white's taking time. What's happening? Queen, queen c8? Whoa. What? Okay, Take queen h8. Check. King b6 or queen b8, both are good. a5 is also good. Not really many options here for black. Just queen g7 even, yeah. Ooh. King b6. Yeah, that's nice. You can't take this queen, everybody, because after h takes, you get a new queen. Now you cannot leave the queen there. So that was a very important moment. And white just simply promotes and wins the same. Who is playing with the white pieces here, Katarina? Let me check that. White pieces. Uh, Yuri Barnakov. Wow. Well, that's a big upset. I mean, 400 plus rating points on chess.com. And against Alex Fishbein. Fishbein, well known grandmaster. And that's, a, that's an upset. Like, so let's keep on with this player. You said Yuri, what was the last name again? Uh, Yuri Barnakov. Yuri Barnakov. I don't know who that is. It does, do we have a rating and an age for Yuri? Uh, I have rating 2283. Okay. So oh, I don't have age. Clearly a good player just beating Alexander Fishbein. And now he's facing off against an international master. So it's not like he gets one win and all of a sudden the rest is history. No, he, goes off against another strong player back-to-back -back and 
What do you make of this opening, this Kali system? I used to play it. I think it's very nice, very easy, very kind of, uh, you know, sound and not challenging to play. You don't have to know theory. You just always put pieces this way and then you figure out what you want to do. Sometimes you can go rook e1 and push e4. Or sometimes you can push on the queen side and you just pick on your mood. I like that. <laughs> <laughs> it, is, it is nice, especially for blitz games, to just be able to play a similar set of moves. You don't have to think, oh, wait, my opponent made this knight move. Is there a tactic here? No, the position is very solid. What I don't like about this position from the white side, typically, is this bishop on b2, because it's stuck behind a wall of pawns. And let me ask you, what was the point of queen c1 here? I was just trying to think about, like, what do you want to do? If maybe, like, bishop c3 and queen b2 and point to nowhere. But probably there was some hidden motive that we couldn't see. Yeah. I mean, you can play knight e5, but then you always have to be worried, is black just going to take on e5 and give me double pawns? I can play knight to d2. So bishop c3 and queen on c1. You see, my idea is coming to fruition. So is that, bishop is that c3. A, is that a good thing, though? <laughs> That's a good thing. It's always a good thing. But I think white wants to play maybe knight to f3, but now we have to be very careful about, like, the two bishop sacrifice. That's it's kind of scary. So probably g3. g3 and then knight d2. Okay. No? So how did you predict this, this bishop c3, queen b2 stuff? I mean, that's what I do when I play with white. You just move the pieces around, and then you decide what you want to do. Maybe you want to play b4, but maybe you decide to play knight b2, f3, and push e4, and then the diagonal. That's going to be fantastic. I mean, OK, wow. knight d2. Yes. Knight d2. OK, so now there's none of this bishop takes g2, bishop h2 stuff, because the queen can't get out over the knight of six. So bishop drops to h7. That frees the e4 square, but as you're saying, f3. What about queen c7 after f3, though? Or queen b8, one of those type of moves. Because how are you going to protect your pawn on h2? That's a good question. I'm not sure how would I do that. Probably play f4 and then destroy <laughs> my, <laughs> my whole idea. I like it. I like it. f3 just to entice queen to b8 or queen 7, then to play f4. But the point that we're making is that f3, queen c7, let's say, there's a problem on h2. And if you play g3, I take on g3, rip the position open, and I, at the very least, have a draw by repetition with queen h3, queen to g3. So... You have to be very careful. B4 was played instead. So not moving the F pawn yet, but now we're going to get to C5, B5, and white has gained very important space. And we have the knight who may go to B3, A5, as we said, as we saw in the previous game and just annoyed the pawns there. I like white's position now. If black has to try to get E5 in somehow, but with the queen on B2, bishop on C3, now we understand, at least I understand it, Katarina. Yeah. You can't play so that's a that's sometimes the issue for black in color systems because you need to decide what you do as black. And if you just stay, uh, then you do not have the, you know, the breaks on the queen side. So black will probably needs to move the knight like to h5, play f5. Okay, not immediately to h5. That would be like horrible, just losing the knight. Uh, yeah, actually, why did bishop went to h7? I don't remember. Because it was under attack on e4. So instead of, uh, it didn't have to go to h7. That's actually maybe a very good point that the bishop should went back to g6 instead. And those little moments, Katarina, they add up, right? Where we make a move like bishop h7. I'll just quickly bring that back here. And bishop was under attack by this knight. And maybe bishop g6 was a better square. But instead went to h7 to be a little safer, or so black thought. But now you regret having the bishop there. Yeah, now white to, needs to decide, OK, white takes. Mm -hmm. And now, now without at, knight. I'm looking at this idea, right? The bishop g2, bishop h2, bishop g2, queen h4 combination. There are often drawing mechanisms that allow black to. Oh, wait. Ooh. Bishop h2, queen h4, bishop g2. Is that a draw? Probably not. It doesn't work. Sadly, but, it doesn't work. But you can move the bishop, so you have to capture the rook and then bishop b8. That looks horrible. Mm, I don't like that. It looks just very passive, right? So you have yeah. to take on a1, is Katarina's point, because if you move your bishop back to b8 or d8, the only safe square is the rook on 8 is hanging everybody. Don't forget that that rook would lose the defense of the rook on f8. So Katarina says rook takes a1, absolutely tossed in. But the problem now is black has no space. So what about like queen g5 to try to do something there? Oh, Pretend okay. we are doing something, g3 and... I can yeah. also play f3 maybe to attack your bishop on e4 and keep two bishops under attack, but I know that's what you want. It's a complicated yeah. position. Because then I can go queen h4. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I agree with that. So bishop b8 was played instead. 
And let me ask you something. Both of us know if this were a classical chess game, only white really has should have winning chances because black is stuck completely. But how does white break through? How do you turn this from what looks like a good position into a concrete thread or some kind of, well, now bishop takes h5 as a free pawn. So before that move h5, what was white's idea? I mean, in some of these positions, you just want to move the king from the king side to queen side, like king f1, you want to run there and then decide if you want to move like f3 and on the king side or trade some pieces. But you have so much time to move the king from g1 to let's say b3 mm -hmm. and to keep it there super safe. And that's, I guess, why black actually went h5, which in hindsight, maybe a good move because now there are ideas with rook h8, queen g5, and things like this, there could be an attack on the white king. I mean, now when we look at the bishop on c3, that's also kind of a sad story. So we need to decide if we want to trade it or, Can, I mean, do you want to play e4, Robert? I was, I was about to ask you the same question, so I'm glad <laughs> you asked it first, because e4 with the point being of d takes for this d5 check, you're just opening everything up and you can even play d6. So e4 is still here. I, I would play e4. It just looks so tempting. It has to be good, right? Yeah. I mean, we have to push from the center because g4, we can open that diagonal. So there's not, not much to do. And e4 happened or did you make the move? Yeah, e4 ha did happen. It still looks very okay. strong. Ooh, okay. Ooh, d5 let's check. That. Here comes d6. Oh, this looks painful. The bishop on b8 is completely locked in here. And white took his pawn from d4 all the way into d6. And this just looks painful. I mean, you will have to sacrifice the bishop for the pawns, but I don't think you can have compensation. No. And white's king looks perfect. He's in a queen e3, hits g5, hits e4, hits e5. Rook e1 also does something similar. And bishop g2. If you take on g2, rook takes e5. Say, I'm not going to take your bishop back right away. I'm going to steal this pawn, and your king on g7 is in deep trouble. Yeah, I mean, the, po the bishop on b8, it's like, it's, it's really missing, missing the game. Wait, you don't like that bishop? I mean, it looks pretty, but it's not doing much. <laughs> I'll, I'll have to agree with you there. And now rook, a queen e3 is also good, hitting g5, hitting e4. This bishop's not doing anything whatsoever. Yeah. So, okay, what else is happening somewhere? Yeah, let's... let's uh, this is just torture. I don't want to be seeing it. I'm sorry. I, I didn't mean to offend <laughs> you with this game. Queen h5, take this rook on e8. Oof. Mm. Yeah, that's a problem. So resignation has indeed occurred. What? Where should we go to next? Um... I see Praveen is playing again. And do you see uh, dry country? Because you know, he, he lost the first round, but that's kind of my style. When I play very serious tournament, I tend to lose the first round. When I was playing chess cha Czech championships, I remember I used to lose every, like so many first rounds, uh, but then I won the tournament or played really well. So. I mean, we should so, still follow him and see how it's going to go. He won his second game, it looks like. And we have this game up between yeah. Praveen and Marty 435. I don't, uh, Marty 435 sounds like a friendly guy just by that username. Like, I, I'm a fan <laughs> of that username. Uh, but what I was I going like, to say, sorry, go ahead. Karen. No, I'm just curious if the king in the center is safe, but the knight and queen looks very strong. Knight e2 coming. And okay, that's, that's game over. Knight Ooh, e2. Checkmate on h1 now. Nice. But I was going to say, Katarina, that if I ever play in a tournament, I'm playing in the first round, and it's like a tournament, I'm just not, I'm going to say, Katarina, I can't win. Because if I win, you're going to win the tournament, what you just told me. <laughs> yep. But sometimes I envy kind of tennis players who, you know, they lose the first round, they are out, they can enjoy their life. And we chess players, we just need to suffer for the rest of the tournament. <laughs> but then you're I supposed... learned to take it as an advantage, so. <laughs> you're supposed to be positive about chess here, right? We're talking about a chess tournament. You're saying, oh, I have to stay in this whole chess tournament even though I lose my first game. By the way, this position should be a draw with proper play here, but it's confusing with pass pawns on opposite sides of the board. But I, I do know what you mean. When you're playing a chess tournament and you start losing games early, you're like, oh, can this tournament just be over with? Um, I can't win first place. And, you know, that's the feeling you get. In a blitz tournament, it's not so bad. The games happen so quickly. I wonder, can you play knight e2 here just to pretend? Like we are giving up a knight and That's then run, run for our life. Well, I think knight two was possible because you're trying to promote the pawn on the G file. Instead, we see this where the knight's going to come to G4 and take on E5, and then the king's going to take on B3, and there will be no more pieces remaining. And so it will be a draw. Interesting knight eight endgame. Yeah. 
and this username is pigs on seventh, which I don't know if you're aware of this. I was doing commentary with Alexandra Botez and she called Brooks in the seventh rank pigs on the seventh or pigs. In a, she called pigs in a blanket. I was like, that's a food, not a chess term. And we have Praveen versus uh, Nico Cheka. So that's the game we'll keep our eyes on for now. But I was like, that's not a chess term. Pigs on the seventh. Have you ever heard that before? I've never heard about that. But you know, I'm sometimes teaching chess kids and I'm like, oh, can you find this checkmate? And they're like, yeah, that's Anaconda checkmate. And I'm like, what? <laughs> like, they just throw names at me and I'm like, okay, if that's how, how people call it, that's fine. I'm all for new names. Like, that sounds cool. But pigs on seventh, that just sounds weird. <laughs> yeah, it sounds kind of, yeah, weird <laughs> to put it safe. <laughs> <laughs> well, we do have a uh, French defense in this game. And I don't know. Katerina, how much we've spoken about the French defense, but if you know anything about me, said I am not a fan of the French defense. However, this is the best French defense you can get because your bishop would see it isn't that bad. I had this position at the Olympiad and I played it for black. It was fantastic. I don't know if I drew or I lost. No, I did not lose. I either drew or, or won, but I was so scared to play French and it did not end badly. So I was very happy. Oh, the lovely French defense where you know, the bishop on c8 tends to stay behind a wall of pawns here because there's been a bunch of trades in the center, right? Black is no longer having d and c pawns, and white has traded off his uh, d and e pawns. That means the bishop has some more open space eventually, bishop d7, bishop c6. However, here, knight f5 looks like a serious move, and after castle, I'm looking at knight takes h6. Not but there's a thing. Here you play king f8, I believe, and it's not that easy for white to break through and you want to play like b5, bishop b7, and suddenly we have kind of weird Sicilian and like it's not doing badly. Okay, I so king, king f8, f8, if I remember correctly here. I trust your memory because castle and king side, the difference is the rook's placement, right? If the rook is on f8, if you castle, then these sacrifices on h6 make a lot of sense. After king f8, I'm threatening your knight on f5. My king has moved off the e file where the pawn e6 has been pinned. And now I can take your knight, so your knight has to probably move. And then, as Katarina said, b5, bishop b7. It's a pretty active position for black. So, well, a lot of time spent here by Nico Cheka. So maybe he's not sure. That's kind of surprising because you have to defend the pawn on g7. Otherwise, uh, I mean, it's pretty much over the game. And castle looks very shaky. It certainly does. And he, whoa. Oh, wow. And Praveen did not be, need to be asked for even a second more. He sacrificed on h6, and now he's thinking, wh what? No, that can't be good. Queen f4 now. That, that okay. really surprised me. But wait, queen f4, why is that a problem? I can even go like rook d1 and be, be as fast as possible with rook d3, rook g3. You're trying to be as fast as possible, but you are down a piece. Okay, bishop e7, bringing another piece to the defense. But now, I mean, your rook d1 move makes perfect sense. Rook d1, rook d3, you just get this rook over to the king side. I don't know, I'm just surprised. But okay, it's game. so surprising not to take pawn on h6. Like, Yeah, it's you take material. a second pawn for the piece, and your bishop would be on h6 attacking a rook in the g7 square. So what do you make of this, Katarina? I mean... Mm -hmm. Oh, not even rook d1. Okay. So, so maybe bishop e5 will follow, and then I just want to play like c4, bishop c3, and that seems so slow, but yeah. these bishops looks fantastic. Yeah, and one of the ideas of a queen f3 to hit this knight on f6, try to force that knight from its square, and so queen f4 is played. I knew queen f4 was coming at some point or another, and the point is that there's bishop e5 now, there's queen to g5. So bishop e5 before bishop d3 was probably better if you're going to play this line, because now the black queen, very importantly, can help in the defense. Queen g4 offers a queen trade, which white cannot afford, being down a piece. And I think that black should be better here. However, in a blitz game, Katarina, one minute, nine seconds left on the clock. Not easy to defend an open king. But I wonder if I play f3 now, like where are you going to go with your queen? Are you going to put it to g7 or g5? Um, because it can be hard for you after if you put it on g5, if I play like king g2 and h4. Yeah. Like, this queen can run out of squares. Queen e3 played. So I guess you didn't want to play f3. It just exposes the white king a little more. And queen on e3. Okay, a queen to g5. So Oh, and now you can play f4 because bishop c5. Oh, good point. Yeah. yeah. F, f4 would be just too exposing eventually for this uh, diagonal. So queen f3 was played instead. And so how unsafe is black's king? You know, we don't have an engine on. We're not 
looking at that, but rook to e5, for instance, is that scary or then is black just with queen g4 back? I mean, it's definitely scary. Maybe it still works, but I would go for h4. I somehow like that uh, I'm pushing the queen immediately and attacking. Mm -hmm. That was played. So you are on the same wavelength as Praveen here, where you're trying to kick the queen off g5. The queen is a very important defender. Queen g4 was played. And I think you have to play queen takes b7. Otherwise, you have no attack, and bishop comes to c6, and black would probably go checkmate the white king. So queen takes b7 is a sad necessity in my opinion. Yeah, I agree. It's really important not to allow bishop to go to c6 immediately and to get some time. Mm -hmm. And now and if you want to play like rook c8 to prepare bishop c6, then I can play bishop takes f6. Nice so you also point. have to be careful about the pieces. What about queen takes a6? Just take all the pawns you can get because white is down one minor piece, a knight. But if I take a third pawn, if we just do point value at least, three pawns for a piece, that looks pretty decent. The problem I'm having is this king on g1 after a move like bishop c5, that king is so unsafe. But what happened to your attitude, Robert, that you can give pieces that are not yours? I would just return the queen to g2. <laughs> I, it's okay to get pieces that are not yours, but you need a follow-up. And bishop takes h6 way back when was that follow-up? Here it looks like black's king is in, I'm sorry, white's king is in big trouble. Black's king is safe because next move is queen takes g3 check. The pawn f2 is pinned. So if you go king g2, then I play rook to b6 and bishop c6 check. And this white king has no defenders over here. I'm starting to get worried for the white king. So I think you should play, I mean, no, queen. Oh, that's a nice move. I like this move. I like it. Protecting g3, attacking b8, but what about queen f3 here? Ignore your rook. That doesn't matter. Queen f3, bishop c6, checkmate on g2 or h1. Okay, it didn't happen. Maybe at some point we need to trade queens. Maybe queen c4. I mean, we have three pawns. You have good queen side, potential on the king side. I Knight like is queen hanging. And Katarina, we need to take clock into account too. Black only has 20 seconds. So queen a5 was played instead. Wait, bishop c6, so queen takes c5, there's queen f3. That looks pretty worrisome, huh? But king f1, right? I'm surviving. And then knight g4, it's just so many black pieces are going after the white king. But actually, you're right, the queen on c5 protects f2, so knight g4 doesn't even threaten it. Oh, also, knight I have check. maybe, but then I have bishop. Can oh I my god. Bishop e4. Oh, knight takes e4? Okay, here I see your pen. Rook takes e4. Now white is the one up material. Bishop takes f6. And you have a bishop and three pawns for a rook all of a sudden. Yeah, I think I think black should have taken with the knight. Now white, okay. let's go h4, h5, yes. Okay. Oh wait, queen takes h6. That looks sort of painful. It's going to be three extra pawns. You take on h7 and then play a4, a5, and push the pawn. Or play like this. Same idea. A4. Just go. Trade trading queens is good for white. Two seconds, one second. Go! Oh my god! <laughs> Played that with one second remaining. That scared me. And here comes the A pawn. Can barrel right through to A7. Nothing that black can do about it. And king takes G5. Good for you. I have two pawns on the queen side. And white is much better here. I don't know if white's winning. I don't want to go and that if you, if you go king F1, the rook is trapped on C2. But okay, not with rook. Um... Yeah, it would have been hard to really trap because king needs to get to D1. But then the F2 pawn would have been under attack. So Somehow this looks like white can never lose this with proper play, but I don't know how you win it. I mean, now king e3, that's... King e3, you can capture the pawn because of bishop d4. Mm -hmm. So e, ooh, e5 is a nice move. Hitting the bishop away, now you take on a7, and I don't think that white will ever be worse here, but how do you win a position like this? Um, you know, I mean, I still have some chances with running with the two pawns on the king side, but it's Definitely uh, more challenging. I like the rook being kind of trapped on c2, mm -hmm. if there is something to do about it. Yeah, that is pretty, well, that's why I guess yeah. Nico played rook to c1, saying my rook's been uncomfortable for a while now. And Katarina, if white, instead of taking on g5 with that h pawn earlier, I traded queens on h7, I don't think that white would have lost his h pawn. And that would have been a big difference in this end game. So uh, I, I think that's the move that Praveen will really regret this queen to g5 check and not queen takes h7 a long time ago. Yeah, and I also think it was not necessary to give up the pawn. I mean, he, he could have played bishop f6 simply to defend the pawn. Mm -hmm. So maybe he thought that running with the a pawn was enough. 
But okay, still, you know, we are trying here. This is a blitz game and we have two pawns. The bishop can be scary. So white is still trying to play for win. Definitely. And the bishop and pawn are doing so well in b2 and c3. You can never actually attack this bishop. It's protected by a pawn. Watch out for bishop b4. That's a tactic. Okay, that's where the king moved out to e6. Don't play king b6. Avoid the dark squares. There's general advice. If there's, your opponent has a dark square bishop, you probably do not want your king on the dark squares. And here, where's that bishop going? Back to c3 probably. I don't Okay, rook d4 check, king e8, king c6 played. Maybe this white king. How do I get this king out here, Katarina? Do you see any way possible? I would just play king g3 to go back and start pushing the pawn f4, g5, mm -hmm. or f5, one of them. Okay. Now, since the rooks are no, no longer doubled on the fifth rank, we can do I this. I like this. I like the oh. way that Praveen is trying here. Okay. The king is kind of not safe. I'm worried about the king. It has to go back. F4. F4. Here comes F5. Your idea is really happening here. And played F5. You can't, play, you can't push the pawns, though, because G6 I take and I have rook G5. So that's the really annoying thing here for white, is I can't yet push these pawns. So maybe bishop D2, but then I lose B2. So I need my bishop somehow. Bishop on F6. Put the bishop there. OK. Yes. And now G6 happened. can be played. So now rook B6. Oh, rook B6 is a problem. We can do that. Mm -hmm. That's a good move. Trying to check this white king from behind. And can we go to... now? B6? No. So we're at rook g1. Isn't it just oh bishop c3? Good move. I have... Bishop d4. But put the bishop on d4 because the bishop on d4 stops the rook from checking on g1. So I, I wanted that bishop there. This is a very complicated position. Yeah. But it's very hard now for white to decide, yeah, especially when the rook is from the other side, from g1, to push the pawns. Right. It's protecting the g6 square a second time. The f pawn, the rook, both teaming up there. So unless, bishop d4 is scary, but there's uh, rook checks and pins. So bishop d4 hits both rooks. Unfortunately, there's rook f1 checks. The rook came back to f2, not to allow this rook coming to f1. And this game is going to last a billion moves. <sighs> Uh-oh. 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 Now black is better because white was pressing for a long time and dropped the pawn. Oh, my gosh. But Katarina, can black win this position or is this b2, bishop, c3 configuration just too strong? I think this is very strong. I think, um, I, mean, I mean, I do not want to trade the rooks, but I'm not sure if even trading the rooks would be such a big issue, but it's definitely safer to not trade the rooks. Right. And we will just dance around and then I think we will make a draw. Why just shouldn't push B4 and shouldn't make any more weaknesses? Just stay, keep checking. That's I right. think we're going to see a draw very soon. Yeah, this B2, Bishop, uh, Bishop, Bishop C3, B2 is so important because the Bishop is stabilized. There's no way that Black can threaten it. And so keeping it protected is important. That's why Tenerife said do not play B4. Wait a second, is this king going to get checkmated on h5? <laughs> no, black is trying to win so hard, so maybe uh, some issues are going to come up. Okay, so rook coming to g4 next, I think, is the plan. All right, and you can allow a trade on g7, I think, but that's scary too, because the rook will come to d8 and to g8, and the king comes back to g6. So this is still serious winning chances uh, if white is not careful, but if white does nothing, and that's the hardest thing to do in chess, right? Just do nothing. Sit on the position. It should be a draw. But if you, you know, try to make a rook trade or something, that's when you could potentially lose a game like this. Yeah. And it's very hard. I mean, Black has to be also careful about dark squares. Because if you trade one of the rooks on the dark square, the king is there, and then the other rook, I mean, you still have to be kind of careful. That is true. And they're at move 122. So the rookie five check. Where's the king going? Is it rookie seven? Rook e7, you, oh, you, I guess you can take on e7, but I'm like looking at ways for white to be tricky here, where if you take me on e7, my pawn gets here, that feels like an opportunity, so. Now I feel like I want to go with the king to b1 to have the bishop free for doing, you know, some dangerous stuff. You want to put your bishop on e7 and then you know, bring your yeah. rook to attack the f7 pawn. Okay, we're we'll move 131. So this game has been going on for a really, really long time. And it seems that White understands very clearly that he doesn't want to trade the rooks. He just wants to move around and make sure the rooks are not forced to be traded. And yeah, moving back and forth, giving checks when possible. That's right. It's one of these games where 
both players at different moments wished there were no increment because without increment, mm-hmm. black would probably like win a game like this, but earlier white would have won. So mm-hmm. it's uh, okay. Protect the pawn. Yeah. They're just repeating now. Move 139. But that's, you know, interesting question now. Imagine, Robert, you are black. Are you going to offer draw? No. And if you are white, are you going to, you know, offer draw? No. <laughs> so I'm, then you I'm, end up playing forever, even though all players know it's a draw. Yeah. Why don't we play forever until the 50 move rule? I don't know when the 50 move rule will take place. It is move 142 right now. So I, I think we can safely say this will be the longest game in the turn. Yeah. If it will ever end. Oh, it's a okay. draw. Whew. Well, Katarina and I will take a short break. We are three rounds in out of nine. We'll be back shortly with more coverage from the Weir Mentory Blitz.
And while we have the games ongoing, we are joined here, thankfully, by U.S. Chess President Alan Priest. Alan, thanks so much for joining us from, well, where are you in this virtual background of yours? <laughs> Actually, I'm in my basement office at home, but you you don't really want to see the stairs that go down behind me. So I, I kind of like being, you know, out in the universe. So I'm out in the chess universe somewhere. Well, Alan, thanks for joining us. And the question for you is, you know, of course, with COVID and uh, in-person tournaments not really being feasible at this time, how did this event all come together? And what was the planning like? And you know, what do you look to see from online events of this nature? That's a great question. You know, uh, there was a real desire on the part of the sponsors uh, of this event to, uh, of these really more than one event, actually, you know, these invitational events that are normally done on site with the U.S. Open to, uh, to, to have them because you have players who've qualified to represent their states. Uh, in the case of the Denker, we've been doing it for a number of years. So there's a tradition involved. And, and so the sponsors that uh, Dwayne Barber and, and some of the other folks who have been on the invitational committee, uh, Mr. Haskell and such, um, really were, were wanting to find a way to do it. And uh, we had a little bit of a trial run with an event for high school seniors, and uh, that went fairly well. So we thought we'll give this a shot and see how it'll go. You know, we, uh, a lot of U.S. chess has been focused on overboard play. And as you said, we can't do overboard play right now in most areas. There are a few areas that are having some small events, but big events are, are really problematic yet. And so um, there is an itch to play, um, and we want to be relevant in that scene. You know, uh, U.S. Chess has tried to move into the online world several different times in, in some event methods that didn't work. So as we're positioned today, we're working with multiple platforms, and we want to be platform agnostic and just provide a framework around how to, uh, how to do events and rate events and provide a rating system that, that is active across platforms. For sure. Um, well, you know, this event here in particular, as you said, it's invite only, and there are so many U.S. chess events. And, well, can you maybe explain a little more about some of the other events that are taking place? Of course, these are state champions. So we know that these players earn their right here. But what are some mm -hmm. other events that people who are watching this can tune into or play themselves? Yeah, we've been having a series of events that U.S. chess is actually uh, running. Um, and, and, and those you can uh, sign up for uh, through the U.S. Chess website, um, and you can find information about it on our website. They're, they're being several times during the week. Um, that's a departure for us. You know, U.S. Chess has typically only run a, a handful of events in the course of the year. So, so that's the easiest way to, to find those, and we're adding to that uh, portfolio uh, fairly consistently as we, as we get the resources to do it. The other thing that we're doing, um, and I was just on a couple hour call last night, um, as we move into our special delegates meeting here in a, in a few weeks, so far um, U.S. Chess rules just have guidelines for online events. And we've had a special task force working now for about two and a half months on turning those guidelines into rules and, and giving uh, U.S. chess tournament directors, uh, uh, some direction and how to do that. We've worked with the platforms to look at their fair play initiatives so that we can, um, uh, you know, because one of the, the issues about online play is the, uh, everyone's concerned about the ease of cheating. And so, you know, we don't want that to happen. We want to have integrity to the online events. So part of this is, is working with the platforms to look at their fair play scenarios and and also to cue in the U.S. chess ethics process just in case we have people who who uh, can't resist the urge that we uh, have a process in place to deal with that as far as members and you know and, and I hate to say it but but people's online play behavior can certainly affect their ability to play over the board when we get to that point again so you know we're trying to put some teeth into it uh, hopefully our delegates will pass that because delegates have to pass the rules and hopefully they will pass that when we have our special delegates meeting on the 15th and 16th of August. Wow, yeah. Uh, Katerina, do you have any questions for Alan? Yeah, I have actually a question 
Uh, what is the most common request, if you know, from state representative now in this time in online chess? Say, say chess. that again, please. I didn't hear the whole thing. I'm sorry. Um, my question is what like the chess representative of each state, what do they wish from USCF during Corona crisis? What is, what is it, you know, that they uh, kind of try to, to do in this situation? Yeah, I, I think what uh, the word we're hearing back from our affiliates or from our state affiliates and from tournament directors again is some guidance. Um, you know, how do I do this? How do I move events uh, online so I can, can keep activity going in my area? We also have some folks who, who are concerned and would like to find ways to return to over the board play. So we have folks asking us for best practices. Um, it's hard to say what best practices are because it's so different every place around the country. But our, our online play task force has been working very hard to come up with best practices for online events. So we hope that that will help. Um, you know, we do have some other play going on. We have, uh, you know, FIDE is working on this online Olympiad. So some of our top players will be participating in that. Um, and, and we're excited about the opportunity to do that. I know that uh, FIDE President Dvorkovich um, kind of came up with this very suddenly and, and threw it on without a whole lot of warning, but I know that Arcadia has been looking for ways to, to engage that. It was very disappointing for him and for all the rest of us to have to uh, cancel the Olympiad event in Russia, which would be going on now, um, but it was the right call to make and, and the opportunity to try to move some of those events online. Um, you know, we have demand for that. We have people who qualified for things, and, and it's a shame that we're not able to do them. So, so some of the folks who qualified for events, we're looking for ways to give them an experience that, uh, that will be unique, like these are, um, and, and give them opportunities that, um, that they've earned, you know, to give them opportunities to participate in ways that they've earned. What I hear is fantastic that you are listening to them and you are actually asking what... Uh how to help and what USCF can do. So I think that's, that's fantastic. Yeah, we've got, um, uh, I got a message from uh, Hatev just earlier today, you know, and we're talking about, I've been the liaison to our top players committee and for several years. And we, you know, we're trying to figure out how the US championship is gonna work. And we're trying to figure out what those are gonna look like as we move forward because certain qualifying events like the US Open aren't happening. So, so how, how are those invitations going to work? That only affects a very small number of our players, but it's important because those events then feed into others. So um, but we're all, you know, everyone right now in the world today is trying to figure it out as we go. And, and I, I, I kind of hate to say it this way, but sometimes we're making it up as we go. Um, but, I, you know, we're getting, we're getting some things figured out. Um, we've been on top of it, I think. You know, U.S. Chess... Uh, very, very early on when all this happened, we looked out and said, this is going to be an issue. So we were one of the first people to apply for a PPP uh, loan, for example, from the government. Um, I mean, we, we applied on the first day that the applications were available. And that helped uh, provide funding for our office team up through the end of June. And in the middle of all this, we, you know, we just rolled out a brand new uh, membership management system that we've been working on for the better part of the year, major IT project that we had uh, largely completed before all this uh, COVID stuff hit. Um, and, and that just went live about two weeks ago. So, you know, we, it's been kind of an exciting time with everything going on. But after having spent uh, nine years now on the executive board, I was kind of hoping that my last month or two would uh, would be a little calmer than what this has been. It's been quite a challenge. <laughs> well, Alan, we certainly appreciate you spearheading the organization and helping with new initiatives and taking on these challenges, one of which is you know, having me email you from time to time, bothering you about certain things as both Tatsev and I represent the top players committee with the U.S. Chess. But Alan, we really want to thank you for your time here joining us and appreciate all the hard work you're doing and will continue to do. So thank you so much. And thank you guys, and thanks for, uh, for putting this on the air so that folks can check on the status of the top players from their states. Of course. Thank you, Alan. Thank you. 
And that was Alan Priest, the U.S. chess president. He's working so hard to bring on not just events like this with top players from their respective states, but as he mentioned, all sorts of different tournaments for members of U.S. chess. And well, look at the prize fund for this event and the events that we will see throughout the next two weekends. There is $120 prizes for the top blitz players in these sections. And then moving forward to the other events, you can see here, two grand up at stake in the Danker, the Barber, the Rockefeller, and the Herring. And importantly, those are college scholarships. The point of these tournaments is for the state champions, elementary school, all the way up towards high school. It is to provide for their future. And I also want to point out the Ursula Foster Award, which is $500 in the Danker, $500 in the Herring. And that was provided by Ursula Foster, who, like Anne Frank, was actually a classmate of hers and a Holocaust survivor who loved the game of chess and her family gave back in providing these awards. So thank you so much to everyone who makes these events possible. Uh, we are very grateful for that. And well, Katarina, there's more chess to be commented on. Yes, and I just realized that uh, we have in this tournament Alice Lee playing. Her nickname is Power of a Point. So what if we go to that game? Because there are not many girls. Is she the only one playing in this tournament? I, I just brought up the game here. So how, what do you know about her? I, I've been coaching now with the US chess school for two months almost, or yeah, two months. And she's doing fantastically. She's such a strong tactic player. Uh, she always comments, you know, I ask for move candidates and variations. She provides that. Uh, she gives even verbal explanations to her variations. She's very dedicated to and hardworking player. So I'm excited to see how she's doing here. And she's from Minnesota, right? If I'm not mistaken? Uh, yes, correct. Okay, so she's representing the state of Minnesota. Uh, she's a very strong player. How She's like very young too, and about a national master just around that rating. And in this position, I personally like it because there's a great knight on e4. There is a semi-open file for this rook on f1, and this bishop on g7 is looking like it's staring into a brick wall of pawns from c3 to e5. 96, very strong. Now the question is if to sacrifice an exchange or give up seven pawn and the knight to d6. That's, yeah. Well, I would have done the same thing. The bishop on g7 at least looks a little nicer. And the rook takes c3 with the d4 pawn under some pressure. There are ideas like that. So I think this was a good decision, which should still be better. But look at the clock, Katarina. I think Alice's biggest advantage is on time. Mm -hmm. And I like the d4 pawn, but maybe we should play rook d1, c4, d5, and, and okay, let's let's do that. Knight d, rook d1. Yeah, queen e7 was played to attack this pawn h4. You may regret putting this pawn on h4 as she did a move up. Whoa, d5 ignoring this pawn. It is under attack, and I think that black, who is searching for Bobby, clearly, that takes this pawn on h4, and how many pawns does black have? Two pawns and a bishop for a rook, and white's king is in worse shape. So I actually like black's position all of a sudden. We also have to be careful about the dark squares, like bishop e5 now. Mm -hmm. It's Okay, the king went to safety. No, not even a check available for white, but I did like your bishop e5 move. Rook e3 says, please play bishop e5 now. I'll take it, and your f7 pawn was under attack, and that would have been a check moving attack. So instead, the rook comes at d7. Good move, rook to e4 to kick the queen. And does she want to trade queens with queen e3? Was, is white or black favored with the queen trade? I'm very careful about weakening all the dark squares. Take this, take that piece. And, <laughs> and then, then on F7. seven and be happy for a draw. Mm. Okay. So instead, white move the king. I guess after bishop b4 check, rook takes over this queen c5, pinning that rook. So that actually is why she did not take. She saw that tactic. I didn't see it initially. But black's position still looks really good. Maybe f5, next move after king to h1, and just start pushing your pawns forward. I wonder whether white can play g4 and just say, okay, I'm going to open it up there, but I have rooks, so I do want open files. G4 Are... looks like a really risky decision. I like it. <laughs> you <laughs> mentioned a move like g4. I'm not going to stop you. And king h1 still under 15 seconds now for black. If f5 is rook to e6, so you don't want to push this f1, even though you don't want to stay defending it. And now rook e7 tempts me because I'm just trying to come after f7. That's all I want to do in this position is create some kind of attack. She puts a rook to f4. Bishop h6 doesn't work. Wait. Uh-oh. Isn't that just a hanging pawn? Uh oh. So it looks like Alice is the recipient of a free pawn thanks to a blunder by uh, Black here. 
Oh, okay, I got afraid about bishop e5, but the bishop is pinned. Good yeah, job. Bishop is now extra pinned, isn't it? Super pinned and probably lost yeah. for good. What a turnaround here. First, white was better. Black smartly sacrificed the exchange and then went to achieve a better position. And then all of a sudden, Alice, she was fighting tooth and nail. She made a tactical. Black didn't have much time. And that's a big victory for her as uh, she gets uh, two and a half points now. So that's good to see. Yeah, nice game. And let's go back towards the top of the leaderboard here. We have Alexander Fishbein with the white pieces, and he has two queens on the board and is just checkmating his opponent. So what did you say, Katarina? You lose the first game, and then you come back. He has won four straight games after an opening round defeat. Yes, I remember one time I lost first first round, and then, then I had seven and a half out of nine points, and I won the tournament. You just keep on winning. So we don't even count the first round with you. You went seven out of eight in that tournament. I mean, That's the thing. Just... I would. I like eleven rounds tournament because the two rounds are like they don't really count. You are just warming up, and then you can play. Okay, and I mean, I don't know about you. I don't know how you do it. I lose my first round. I end up having a bad tournament. You lose your first round. Fishbone loses first round. Oh, nice decision there by Pigs in the seventh. I don't know who that is, but I. You know, we already talked about the username. He gave up the bishop to promote his pawn, and that's a really good illustration of how the you know, immediate piece under attack, it may be defended tactically. And after c2, when rook to c8, instead of taking on c2 to give up the a6 pawn, gave up this bishop on d3 so that the rook could slide behind this past pawn and there's no way for black to, to stop it without losing a full rook. So really nice decision there by pigs on the seven. Yes, and pigs on seven is Samruk Narayan. Gotcha. Yeah. Well, I mean, it's just, I'm, I'm just going with pig on seven now. <laughs> It's easier. No, no need for a name. Just pigs on seven, and we are getting now the next round. Now the rook is not on the seven, and it's still winning. That's very sad when that happens. I'm opening. It's Aiden Turgut with the white pieces taking on Alexander Fishbein here, and well, we have an Italian game. And what do you know about Aiden? Because you have done some coaching with the U.S. Chess School. Has he been one of the students? Uh, let me see the name. Yes, exactly. yes, he was definitely one of the students. Also very active because I remember the name. There, there are around 80 kids connecting to these chess classes. And I even had one two hours ago or three hours ago. Um, so it's hard to keep track of all the kids. So you notice those that are active and they're messaging you or discussing their lines. And he's been one of them. So, well, in this line here, white has Knights in F3 and G3, but the knight in G3 in particular doesn't look very good against a pawn in G6. I say this often, Katarina, a pawn three squares from a, away from a knight dominates that knight. And this G6 pawn is doing really well against this knight on G3, but white also has fully developed. There are no weaknesses in the position. So how do you see this game continuing? White, again, goes kind of for this idea we saw before, knight H2, knight G4. I think that's one of the really common ideas in Rui Lopez to kind of activate the knight there and decide what to do on the king side. Alternatively, we can play queen d2, rook d1, think about d4, or well, maybe play immediately. d4 was certainly thought about and played right away. And now d5 is a big threat. So that's the problem is knight on c6 is pinned to the rook on e8. So bishop d7 is possible. Instead, fishbind takes on d4. I like that move. When you have less space, you feel a little bit restricted. You want to trade some pieces. And now at the very least, the pawn on e4 will in the future be a target. So what black has gained something concrete to put pressure on, but then there's this d6 pawn. So who do you think is trade favorite? The question is, I think whether black is able to play rook d8 and d4, I mean d5, and kind of trade the pawn and have some open files, or whether the pawn will be just a weakness and a problem in the future. Mm. And I don't know the answer to this. But I kind of like the black's position now. I, I feel too. white is too open, pieces not developed. The rook on a1, okay, is it? Oh, capturing. Interesting. Interesting move there to capture on c6. I was going to say that if we just go back really quickly to before the capture on c6, I wanted this knight on c3 rather than d4. Normally, you like your knight on d4, but here the knight on c4 was restricting black a little more. Oop, what did I just do? I downloaded the game instead of clicking to refresh it. So now I have it. I saved copy. I'm glad to have that. And the bishop came to d4, queen to b7. So putting some pressure on b2, nothing severe. The e4 pawn still will require some defense. Maybe black will play c5 at some moment to 
added an additional attacker on e4. So it's kind of getting tactical here. It seems very positional, and now all of a sudden, there may be some tactics that both sides need to be, keep an eye on. I think white needs to play a rook b1, no? Just queen c2. What about c5 now? c5 is possible. Rook e6, the double rooks on the e file is possible. Um, maybe c5. Yeah, I don't actually see an exact issue with it. But if white will eventually play e5, I'd rather my pawn be on c6 than on c5. I think. So rook to d5 play well. Okay, not, neither of the moves that we were looking at. I don't like d5 too much. Me neither. I just feel like black's pawn structure really bad. You already have an a7 pawn isolated. Now you're going to have an isolated c or d pawn, whereas white's pawn structure is perfect. Right on the queen side with a2 and b2. What if I play something like queen c3? Oh. Oh, maybe it's just knight takes e4, but. Oh, queen c3 is possible. If knight takes e4, there's rook takes e4. So your idea oh. actually is really nice. Where rook takes e4, and I protect my bishop. And if you take my rook, down goes your bishop on g7. So that would be a really nice tactical shot. And after queen c3, I don't know. Actually, I, I like that move. You, your move spoke to me there. Instead, we saw rook a to d1, a calmer move, bring the rook towards the center. I mean, if you don't know what to do and you are playing a blitz game, it's a good way to develop your pieces. So there's yes. definitely nothing too, too bad with rook a d1. Rook a d8, copy it. <laughs> now e5, right? Unless queen c3 still works. Oh. I really like to take advantage of the diagonal. Wait, but there's a yes. difference. Huh? The rook on d1 is bad. Because queen c3, uh -oh. Oh, b3, so queen c3, knight e4, if rook takes e4, which you want to play, the d takes e4, and the bishop on g7 is not hanging because the rook on d1 is hanging. But I can capture with knight after you take on e, because now your rook is pinned. Oh, you're sneaky. And so I have to take, and then you take, and then I take, oh, too many trades. I can't think about that now. b3 is played. <laughs> but I think your queen c3 move in multiple moments there was good. And now look at this by um, Aiden here. He takes on f6, will take on e4 next, and try to play knight against bishop with these isolated queenside pawns. I think that white's position is just nice here. Yes, I think the c6 pawn, that would be a problem. And the knight on c5 would be super beautiful. And the bishop had to go to g7. Bishop d4 oh, with the pawn c5 would have been nice, but I was sacked on d4 and had knight f6 check. So this square is very important. I thought about playing knight d6, but there is rook e1, kind of intermediate move, very strong. Yeah, it's a, so, a good thing to point out. The knight d6 looks like a fork on the queen and the rook, but as Katarina said, rook takes e1, this check forces my rook away, and then I'm losing this knight on d6. So that's a bad decision, and that's why instead of knight d6, we saw rook d8, rook d8, and now queen to c4. Look at this light square control, hitting f7, putting pressure on c6. Queen b5, I think, was a very good move, by the way by mm -hmm. Fishbine, and we'll see if he'll, he's going to show some grandmaster technique to hold on to his position and maybe even play for more because it's such a double-edged type of position where you're playing for different ideas. The good thing is Black can now force the queen exchange after rook d4, but Black is worried about probably back rank. Mm -hmm. So oh, F, okay. oof. That makes the square e6 weaker, but there's nothing really there. Knight g5 is the rook d1 check. I'm not really scared of knight g5 into e6. So I still like knight g5 is the best move. It just isn't so threatening. So rook d1 and then bishop d4 is what I would play. Yes, that's what's happening. Are you going to push h6 as an intermediate move? No. Mm. Just trying to kick this knight away. And so the knight's going into e6. So am I welcoming the knight or am I? Kicking it off of a good square. That's kind of the question. Yeah, so can we take on a2 or are we too worried about some back rank issues? I mean, worried about it, but Fishman isn't. I mean, it's interesting. If you just play rook d6 back, you develop the king, you transfer the bishop to b6 as black, are you worse? Yes, but maybe not that much worse. They agree on no! Oh. No! I Why? do not like draw offers. There's so much play to do. Okay. I agree. And this is a good moment for if you're, you know, any of your students or people watching, just in general. There's so much play here. When you look at this position, you don't say, oh, it's completely a draw, of course. There's no play left. White has 11 seconds left. 
Black has a rook on d2 that's about to take here. And yes, with best play, this game will be a draw, but that requires best play and it's bliss shots. I have a question, Robert. Would you offer a draw? I mean, would you take a draw if you were white here with 11 seconds? Because as black, I would I would not accept draw. I would not have accepted a draw either with black. I would have certainly have played on. So I, not disappointed, it's a little strong, but I wish they had continued. And speaking of continued, look at this game with Nico Cheka. Here he is, the black pieces. Why am I seeing this from his perspective? Let's flip the board around. White has two minor pieces and two pawns for a rook. Katarina, I like black here for sure. For sure. That's strong of a oh. language. Okay, I thought one of the rooks was in trouble. There, knight d3. Oh, so if I take went... them? Mm -hmm. Okay, maybe I I don't know. I feel like there's some background check in this alley. Rook takes h2, threatens rook to b1. The white is taking everything that's possible, and I understand that. <laughs> Greedy, indeed. Oh, bishop e2 is a nice move. And you're going to play bishop d1 after rook c1 check. I think. I mean, this is very hard now to play for win for black. Okay, knight a tribe. And then you take on e2. You, I think black has to after knight a tribe take on. Wait, but why not bishop c4 to play for some attacks? I think. Okay, bishop d1, rook h1. And see, this is the best that black could get. And now it's a position that should be a draw with proper play. You just keep your knight defended, and then there's nothing really that black can do. But I felt like white had some choices there with the light square bishop. But okay, draw I, seems like an okay result. This is the second time we have seen speed skater, Nico Cheka, up in exchange for a pawn in an end game. And this one, it's only moved 62. So will this game go to 140 moves? Oh, gosh. Uh-oh. Oh. No. The answer would be no. Oh, what happened? Com commentator's curse. Mm. Commentator's curse for real. Let's go back into that moment there. Because what happened was the rook went to g6, attacking this pawn on g4. And so white needed to play a move like knight to f4, or knight to e3, to protect this pawn. And by, or cut the rook on b4 off from the pawn. So instead, white went knight to h4 and immediately lost the game because it's a rook takes g4, it's check, and both rooks pile up pressure on the knight. That's, oh, that's sad. That's sad. It happens in blitz, though, all the time. <sighs> Moving on. Okay, so what about the next game? Oh, rook versus bishop. Okay, something <laughs> else do we have there? <laughs> Something else? You're asking so much for me. We have this game here, which is knight and pawn versus bishop. So we don't have too many options right now. Okay, this, this is interesting, actually. Yeah? Yes, to move the king. Actually, you can move anywhere the king to make it a win. The bishop will always be able to go to c5. Yeah. Bishop d4. I'm going to just take your pawn whenever it gets to a dark square. Otherwise, you're just maneuvering around forever. The only chance that white has is because white is up a minute and 30 seconds on the clock. So there could be a mouse slip, a blunder, uh, you know, a bad pre-move, something like that. You know, like Bishop e5 here. Oh my gosh! Oh no! I just, oh no! I just said like Bishop e5, and it happened. Oh, that's that's bad. So sad. That is. But you know, it's a blitz. It's a blitz tournament. Like people shouldn't be too hard on themselves. It happens. You blunder. No, I'm not hard on. I mean, it's move. 100 of this game i'm not one of them it's my fault you know i blame myself i said it out loud and i kind of stated it into existence yeah uh, we got to see that one more time because that was the one way that unfortunately Bl black could lose this game is by allowing a trade into a king and pawn endgame bishop h8 bishop e7 something anything was a draw here just allowed the quick knight fork and the trade and white played perfectly bringing the king up Getting opposition with Zugzwang. The king wants to stay on c7 and pass the turn to white. Instead, the king has to pick a side, and then the white king will pick the other side and march forward and help this pawn out. And there you see the rest is simple. c6, c7, c8 equals queen. Katarina, I just feel bad now. It happens. So let's go on to the last game, because it's interesting how black is defending really well with the right corner. Mm -hmm. OK, just end <laughs> Well, the, the, even if bishop takes rook wasn't possible, bishop h7 still draws. Because normally you play king f7, and then the, the king would have to move away from the bishop. But because it's all the way in the corner, that's stalemate. 
So in order to avoid standard, the king has to move away, in which case the black king gets the g7 square, or the rook needs to move off the h file, in which case the bishop is free to start moving again. So this game was a draw. Katarina, you and I will take a quick break again, and when we return, we will have the final three rounds of action from the Weirementary Blitz.
And as we return, we just want to remind you that if you're willing and able to support chess in the United States, please do so by supporting the U.S. Chess Federation. It is a 501c3 tax-deductible donation. So go to uschess.org and find more details there with the donate button. And also a reminder that the this, this schedule that will be coming up here in these premier invitationals, the Danker and the Herring, the senior, they start tomorrow. And then starting on August 1st, as you see, there will be the Barber and Rockefeller joining the seniors playing then. So it will be a two-weekend affair, a lot of exciting chess ahead. Many of the uh, top American talent from every single state, it should be a lot of fun. And we return here now for the Blitz, the Weirmentary Blitz. And I have this game up here, Katarina, between Harlem for Brew, that's uh, Burrington Hardaway, and he's playing against international master Andrew Hong. And it's a crazy looking position with a rook on G5. That looks pretty menacing. So what do you make of this position? I mean, we still have the rook on A1 that's not doing anything. So I would like to bring that rook to a play, but it's very hard now for black to, to defend with some, maybe knight h6 now. I mean, this looks Oof. very, very dangerous. And then knight g5 to like, knight g4 to improve. To improve uh, it on defense. Rook yeah. f1. So what is the point of rook f1 there? I'm trying to figure that out. Like, why did the rook belong on f Is there f4, f5 coming? Something like that. That's interesting if that's bishop h3 instead, okay. Well, anytime just, you play f4, I can trade the queens with queen b6. True. That is true. So I need to be a little bit careful because white wants to keep the queens on. It is even material. I didn't even do a material count. Rook takes g6 now. Watch out for that. So knight h7 play. The queen on c6 protects. How to continue this attack? Knight h6. King f8 I'd play. Or king g7. And now knight f5. So repeating moves. Katarina... What's going to happen in this game? Both sides under 20 seconds. No, I think White has to play Rook H5. Whoa, King H8 playing oh. for a win, but that may be playing for a loss. That's so dangerous. And 96 coming right now. 96 played. And what's the idea? We're at Knight F4, threatening 92 check and the Rook on H5. And Rook to G8. Uh-oh, this is turning around a little bit. No, just Knight takes E4. Knight E4, Rook E4. And king, no, rook, rook f5. 92 check, bang. But that's still fine. King G2. Both rooks are going to be hanging, the rook on f6 and the rook. Oh, oh there's knight on h7, I forgot. <laughs> the knight's just been hanging out on h7, so it's easy to forget about. And now somehow we're in a rook and bishop with rook and knight end game. Whose position would you rather have? I like the bishop on f5, but two pawns... Oh, no, the material is equal. White, absolutely. Yes, because you like the outside pass pawn here. Potential with b4, a4, b5, a5, push those pawns. But still, I really like that position with the rooks attacking the king. What happened? It yeah. was a blitz game, and the perfect continuation was not spotted, in which case, well, this still looks really good for white. I think that king up to f5, that's why rook to b5 was played. No, you may not bring your king into the attack. Reminder to everybody that in end games, the king can be an aggressive attacking piece. And bishop being a long range piece, that's why white is trying to trade the rooks off. Take me, please. And then I'll let a3b4 to distract black's pieces. Instead, black's playing on. I think there's a lot of psychological pressure on the international master with the higher title and fewer points. But I'm wondering why, yeah, finally, why I was wondering why white is all playing on the queen side, but now a3b4, we are seeing, okay, a4 is a strong move to block the. Kind of advancement with the pawns. Mm -hmm. And I was thinking of rook c4 just to attack the a4 pawn, but we haven't seen that. Now knight c5 is coming for black. Knight c5 now, perhaps? Rook okay, c5. White has not done so much of these past moves. I feel like the, yo, that black king, that's kind of dangerous in the center. So bishop e4, I thought the king was going on to c4, he decides to retreat a little bit. Rook e5 could be played. So I don't know if either side is certain which pieces they want to trade. White is trying not to trade. Chat tried to trade rooks earlier, but now isn't really trading anything. And black could have traded pieces at some point and decided not to. So very complex. But there was a strong move bishop e6, maybe. Oh. Okay, now I think I prefer black because this knight Cause... can jump anywhere. So knight c4 could have been played there. Now knight c4 cannot be played without losing the a4 pawn. 
but it looked like knight c4 was a really legitimate option going after the b2 pawn and trying to force the bishop to board here d3 and if king e3 there's knight c4 check he plays it and if you don't knight c4 knight takes b2 knight takes d1 king f4 at the end you scoop up the g4 pawn. Yeah. that's a very strong and the king is very active yeah white problem is this it just goes to show that in the end game the king is an aggressive attacking piece and this is where you see it and the f pawn will rush through I think White at some moment just lost track of what he wants to do and kind of moved around, not really accomplishing anything. Um, yeah, yeah, he was kind of shuffling back and forth, no real plan. And it was hard to come up with a plan. And on the other side of things, Andrew Hong, the speed of light, international master, he was just, he was ready. He was ready to combat White's threats and create little threats of his own and eventually scoop up the full point. So a big win for him. He goes to uh, four and a half of the seven. And I see the standings here. We have speed skater in first place, clearly. And Speed Skater is playing our favorite username, Mac Daddy Mac. No, that's your favorite username. <laughs> <laughs> What's your favorite username? I actually like the speed of life. Like the kids are so creative. I mean, some of them are actually not kids, but they are so creative with their usernames. I like that. So yeah, speed of life is pretty cool. I don't know. Speed of light is something you hear about pretty often. You, know, you get into physics classes and then you start talking. Okay. So that's another conversation for another time. <laughs> and we have the speed skater. So imagine that he likes to rollerblade, roller skate, I, I guess. And with the black pieces, it is a French. It's uh, the type of French that actually I think is decent from Black's point of view. Knight h6 or knight e7, I believe. I think knight h6 is the right move here. That mm -hmm. way you don't block your bishop on a thing. Yeah, and surprisingly, white is, I don't know if it, white is, okay. Taking, taking, nine, eight, six. I don't like That's capturing a... on d4 there. No, you allow white to play b4? You, you allow white to play b4, but you also allow just knight to c3, very simply. I would have played knight c3 and just try to develop. Uh, the bishop came to b2, protecting this pawn a third time, which is important. And in general, I feel like the position is one where white just pushes forward on the king side without too much difficulty, and black is hoping more than anything for some kind of queen set initiative but it's not really clear how to accomplish it. I usually like this position for white because I feel the knight on f5 will get kicked out with g4 one day and then the pawns on the king side will run. And that yep, seems and very G4. comfortable. Oh, so right now. Knight h4, right? Just to trade off the knights. I think that's the right way to play this and it has indeed been played. And after trading on h4, black will eventually try to play f6 and open up some files, some lines for his pieces, and especially the rook on f8, once you castle. Okay, this is... Oh. Wait. What is white doing? Not castling short side? Okay, go knight takes e5. Ooh. And queen takes f2, then... probably. Hmm. Did not go for it. I, again, not my pieces. Happy to sacrifice them. I didn't see a conclusion to the game. I just saw a potential sacrifice, and I went with it. Can you still play knight takes e5? I think now it's even stronger. But I think now you can play just f6. Like, be very happy that you are opening the file and not giving up pieces. How come you don't want to sacrifice the knight? You instead want to play the very calm but very good move. Wait, this should be seven was played, but f6 was a great move, by the way. But why not knight takes e5 then? I mean, if I don't see a direct continuation, I then you just get stuck with being piece, piece less. So. so I hope everybody's listening to what Katarina just said. <laughs> I saying knight takes e5, knight takes e5, but I also admitted I didn't see the direct way to a checkmate or anything like that. So if you don't see all the way through, especially in a blitz game, it's often it's better to just sit on a good position, which is what Nico Check, a speed skater, is doing here. And I like what you're saying. Sorry. So go ahead here. In this position, what are you seeing for black? But now, you know, the king is very open. And now when we sag, now it's going to be a different story because the king... Uh, and h4 is going to be hanging. Maybe I would start with rook c8 first and then to take on e5. I like rook but c8. Doubling... Okay, as well. Yeah, rook f4 is more direct, hitting this pawn d4, and it's not a very easy way for white to defend it. Now rook can even go to f8, although I liked your rook c8 move before. Now rook c8 doesn't make so much sense because the knight can come to c5. So that's why the rook swung over to f8. But your idea earlier with rook c8 looked very tempting for me. And all right, Katarina, it looks amazing for black. Oh my gosh, castle queenside. But oh, wow. what I was going to say is, how do you get it from looking really good to actually being concretely good? What, what move here 
do you play? Like, what idea do you do? You go bishop e8, bishop g6 in a typical French maneuver, or is there something better? A5 comes to mind. I'm not sure. I mean, now I look. Now I kind of like bishop takes b4, but your bishop e8 and bishop g6 looks very nice. But mine was played, so that's better. <laughs> it's so funny. I'm I'm suggesting sacrifices like six different times. Then the one time I play mm -hmm. casually. You're like, oh, wait, what about bishop takes b4? So your move is definitely good because this king on c1 is about to be in big trouble. Actually, the queen has no good moves. Knight, knight a2. a2. Yeah. yeah. Oh, now knight c5. I actually think white's surviving this. For now, not for very long. But okay, but knight c5, I go rook c8. And, and I then I take your rook on f4, maybe? What? No, giving up that bishop? Okay, rook f2. No, okay. Oh, rook f2 looks really strong. And why did, why, why would you okay, take the bishop on d1? I don't understand bishop takes d1 instead of rook takes d1. Not that it's the biggest thing, deal in the world, it just seemed a little the, strange to me. Rook are the, rooks are the worst defenders. So if there is rook on d1, it cannot really help the king uh, not getting checkmated, but bishops are much better. So. I'm not sure. I mean, the bishop was hanging, and if you don't want to pin the knight, you do have to figure out what to do with the bishop. So. Okay, so what's happening here? Do you still trust this position for black, Robert? I'm looking at bishop a4, eventually bishop d7, bishop takes d6, or g5, bishop g4. That's my idea for white. For black, I would play, okay, rook c8 makes sense to I, I pin this knight here, although I don't know what the next one's going to be. Knight a6, is that really the idea? Maybe. I simple? was... I was kind of looking, what about rook f1 instead of rook c8, you know? Like, I don't like to trade, but I like to have control of the uh, of the first rank. That actually made a lot of sense. Is another idea, by the way, knight d3? Is that the real threat that I didn't see at first? Wow, that's fancy. Because the knight is pinned to the queen. The queen can't take because it would be checkmate on b2. So knight d3 actually is a very, very, very intense threat. I don't think so it's very d3. Yeah, you repeat it one more time. <laughs> <laughs> very, 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 very big threat. Okay, so, so what if I play knight d7? Is that knight d7. and queen d8 maybe? But in the okay. Okay, rook d3, rook a3 is rook h3. Sorry, it's an interesting idea. But that's what a problem. This this bishop is now pinned to the king. And you can play king c1. Oh, this is. This looks a little passive. Maybe a a four now. A four. The knight's pinned. The bishop's pinned. Knight a six played instead, taking advantage of the fact that this knight cannot move without losing the queen. This looks really good. Maybe rook to c three. Swing that rook over to protect the c five square is very important. Rook to b three played instead. Good move as well, hitting the mm -hmm. queen. It's actually a really complicated position because of this two minor pieces for rook dynamic. It doesn't feel evident because black has been pushing this whole time. But as soon as white is able to safeguard his king, then that's when the bishops can make their presence felt. Unfortunately, bishop on b2 and bishop on d1 aren't doing anything yet. But I'm not sure how black can continue. Let's say if I play queen d2 here. OK. I mean, trading is still good for queen d2. Uh, for I think your move is smart. Just queen d2, knight to d3. I didn't like that move because your knight's trapped. And queen c2 is coming. Ooh. Uh-oh. So maybe like h5, h6, pretending something. Okay, sacked on e6, hoping that this, I don't, I don't know what's really being hoped. Oh, no. No, OK, this is, I mean, black was pushing for a long time, but I think white, white was fine there for a second. Queen g5, that's the, it's funny. Sometimes you play a move to be aggressive, and it just backfires immediately. Queen d2 was much stronger because then if b6, white retreats the knight to d3 and trying to trade off this aggressive piece. Now you have the two bishops against a rook and white black is two extra pawns, but the pawns aren't easy to mobilize just yet. So I think that was a better opportunity. Instead, we saw a quick uh, defeat there. So let's go to the game between TN knight moves and Praveen B 2002. That's Praveen Balakrishnan. And I assume that an international master with Tennessee in the username it's probably Ron Burnett, isn't it? Let me check that. There's a pin on this knight here, and this A pawn is very strong. 
So as long as Black's King doesn't get checkmated, it feels like some kind of A2 type of move is just going to result in a quick win. But Queen F2, correct. it was Ron Burnett? Yes. Yeah, Ron Burnett is uh, been a chess player for a very long time. He's an international master. He's a very friendly guy from Tennessee. I played him a bunch of times when he, I was younger. And, well, unfortunately for him, this game did not go his way. Praveen Balakrishna wins with Black. So... Yeah. Pigs on seventh. Why is Pigs on seventh always the game that's still going? And now it's on seventh. <laughs> there it's, was a, it's over, but there was a rook on the seventh rank. And now we enter the final round of action here. We have Speed Skater in first with six and a half out of eight. We have four players with five and a half out of eight. It's Dry County, Praveen, Speed of Light, and Volcano Explorer, which means that Speed Skater gets to play Pigs on seventh, and Pigs on seventh can be the spoiler. So Speed Skater just needs to make a draw, and he wins the tournament. Oh, wow, having white and needing just a draw, that's a, it's kind of a nice condition. Yeah, you uh, just need to make a draw. So play calmly and do things. But I mean, Karen, we've all been in this situation, right? Where you only need a draw, you play too solidly, and you're not coming up with ideas that you may need to. Because sometimes the best plan or the quote unquote safest plan is an aggressive plan. So just being too. Oh, wow. <laughs> You are out of your words. <laughs> it's okay, Robert. Black didn't want to win, was worried. There is tomorrow. Um, okay, moving to the next game between Mate Schmidt and Praveen B. This one looks really bad for White because I don't believe in these kind of sacrifices. It's like, what this called? It's called a Karakon defense, Hillbilly. Schaefer Gambit. There's no way that's the <laughs> real name of this opening. Okay, oh. so what's happening here? Bishop h6 is going to be kind of nice for white. Yeah, because black can't use the castle with knight g5 coming as well. That's like a pretty big attack. Should I believe in this hillbilly Schaefer Gambit? I mean, if chess.com says it, you better believe it. And h6, I guess g5 is an option for black at some point. A bit of risky move to eventually play g5, but it's possible. If I'm white, oh my gosh, g4. Katarina, is this your style of game here? No, no, absolutely not. There is no, no castle, so g4 could wait. But I like the idea. I mean, after h5, you can play g5 and just to completely block it. So it, it has a good idea, but... I like to developing pieces, and I see bishop on c1 is not developed, rook on a1 is not developed, and we do nothing about those pieces. That's kind of sad. Yeah, and if you're down a pawn, you really want to have piece activity, and the knight on e4 looks good, the knight on f3, the rook on f1, all these pieces look pretty good, but it's just not quite enough, as black is so solid with the knight on d7 now, the knight on d5, the bishop on e6, bishop on g7, those four minor pieces are protecting the black king, and so there's no immediate attack to speak of, although... One important thing, Katerina, I'm going to throw it to you. Where can Black move? Because if you go knight d6, either knight, and that doesn't knight d7 moves, that knight c5. So I don't really see exactly how Black untangles. So how does Black do so? Black just went to long castle. So queen c7 was the first move played. Now I just want to long castle. Then f5, everything on fire. I mean, I don't understand why to play c3. Like the pawn on d4 was defended enough. So why not just bishop d2 to develop? That's actually a very good point. Bishop d2 was certainly a better move. And now we're here. Bishop d2 makes sense still and was just played. And then rook a to e1. But as you point out, once black castles... Okay, f5 before castle, that could never be a move I would play. No. It's no. too early. Okay, Wait, what if, if I, I just capture? Maybe black wants to play g5? No way. And a queen h5 check even? I mean, this is... Bishop f7. But I think after... Oh, okay, never mind. Okay, rook 81, just bring that rook over. Somehow this felt early, but maybe it's... Wait, bishop f6 traps the queen. Uh-oh. No, I have knight... No, I don't have knight g5. Nope, that's a queen that's lost. Okay, so I can take, take the bishop on f5 and have a pair of bishop for a queen. I would do that, for sure. Take on f5, take on h4, and you have two bishops for a queen 
which in a classical game of chess, it probably wouldn't be such a big deal. Easy to fend those off. In a blitz game, weird things have happened. Wow, but how come Black was actually doing okay with F5? I can't believe this. Yeah, okay, Knight G3 C4 was a little sense. clumsy, I guess. And sorry. No, the problem is the white pieces are kind of misplaced. Again, like, you know, sometimes if you have two bishops for a queen, maybe they can be really strong. But our bishop on b3 is just like kind of bored there. Yeah, you would need this bishop on g4 and then the other bishop on g3, like actually staring into an attacking position. Here, the pieces are not coordinated very well, particularly this bishop on b3. And now, once I take on d5, my rook gets into the game. This is just. What if I play bishop c3, bishop e5, just to get some play there? Well, bishop c3, there was knight e2 check, which is why the rook came to e1, uh, just to avoid all of the trades. And now here goes one bishop. And now pawn takes d5. I think you can just steal this one here. Eventually, your idea with bishop c3, bishop e5 will be a good move. But for the time being, black's not super afraid of this. So if I go knight, um, knight e5 now, <clears throat> nope. Oh, this way. Okay, attacks this knight, threatens knight e6 ideas. So it does make sense. Black can play so many different moves here. You can play d5 as you just played. If bishop takes, pawn takes, knight e6, I have queen b6 check. And yes, you'll win my rook on d8 probably eventually, but I don't really care about that exchange. I'm up to so many pieces. So queen I mean, b6. Queen will be so powerful now. Yeah. Now it's about the weak white king. Yeah, there will be no compensation. I mean, the king, the knights cannot checkmate the king. Yeah. No, this is over. Yeah. And one of the important things that this game shows is that when you're up a lot of material, as black was up a queen for two minor pieces, giving some of the material back can often make your position easier. So you white lost one of the attacking pieces this knight and took a rook in the process. But look now, it is a queen for a rook and a piece. And how many extra pawns does black have? Three pawns. And now it's just... Once you take this b2 or c5 pawn, it's a third, and it just wins. So let's go to, do we have any other games? We have Speed of Light playing. And we also have Alice Lee. We have Power of a Point. Let's go there. She is playing with the white pieces against Volcano Explorer. That's Aiden Turgut. And what's happening here? Oh, yeah, Farouk on the seventh rank. Everybody is happy about that. Wait, isn't white up Wait, a piece? Can I just... No, no. It's, it's oh, okay. The one pawn. One pawn can return. But the seventh rank is so weak. I mean, black is definitely going to have a lot of issues with that g7 pawn. Right. Queen c3 is about to happen, and that's just a quick mating attack. So white, black has a move. Queen c4 played, and I would not trade queens, right? We're talking about how powerful this rook is in the seventh rank. I'd play queen to f5 and then try to attack g7. The bishop on f1 is actually misplaced here. So I think going to f5 and trying to win on time and win on position is the way to go. Yes, and again, you will have, I mean, the rook on a8 is not developed. I mean, we talk about developing pieces. It's really important. And queen d2, okay, it's the same idea with maybe going queen g5. Mm -hmm. But I think knight, queen f5 looked really stronger. So bishop g6, and now queen e7, there's queen f7. So somehow black is barely holding on here. Barely. Queen f okay, bishop f7 also somehow survives. The queen protects on f7. And now are we going to see a queen trade after queen e6? Okay, one here. But that, that looks like you're going too far away from your king. Bishop g3. And where does this queen think it's going? Queen f5, just take a pawn on c6, I think, and happily be up two pawns. But Katarina, this is the tough part. Opposite colored bishop endgames. If the queens come off, is white winning this game? But why is white is two pawns up? I think, wait, what oh. happened? Yep, queen b5. So the the rook is not lost, but so two pawns up, opposite colored bishops. Would white win this game? Yes. I think Without I the queens. Win. Okay. Oh, well, if you take on a5, it's three pawns. So I think you can win that. That's for sure. I wonder whether you can then capture on f3 to sacrifice and make some kind of perpetual. That's annoying. So that's probably why from queen c5 to f bishop f3, I take, and I'd be f2 square under my control. So queen c3. Black has two seconds, one second, and white only is 10 seconds. So this is actually going to be a scramble here. Queen d4, stopping any kind of h4, hitting the bishop. Rook c5 now, I think. Bishop e5. Let's play bishop Ooh. e5. I like that. 
Now I'm not, I don't like bishop e5 because g2 is checkmate. So you have to be careful here if you're rook takes a2, just steal that pawn. Wait, free bishop on f7. Rook g2 is only no, one no, check. King h1. Then king h1. She found it. She found it. King h1. No more checks without losing material. Good job. And queen h5 is checkmate. Queen g7 is checkmate. Just take this rook. It's free. Then play bishop g1. No more checks. The queen covers up. What a finish. Wow. That was really fast calculation with like five seconds on clock. Seriously. I mean, it's scary to allow rook takes g2, but she had a bishop there. And now she also is gaining two seconds per move. So even if she doesn't find the right checkmate, and rook f8 is checkmate in one, she does find it, but she's gaining time. The Let's go back to that moment there because it was really getting scary for white all of a sudden. I mean, queen of c2 happens and you're threatening this big check. And we see that speed scares Nico Cheka wins. We had Fishbein second. He lost the first game, but ended up in second place with Praveen Balakrishnan. And very importantly, because if Black had won in this game, in Turkey, he would have tied for second. Queen takes f7, says, please have this pawn on g2. It's worth it for me. Queen h5, queen g7, both checkmates. She ends up winning the game because Black has nothing better to do than give up the rook. What a game. Wow, really nice. And, you know, it looks scary, rook takes g2, but if you see king h1, then you're like, okay, there's nothing else to do. Um, you definitely take on f7. Oh, what a finish. Unfortunately for Aiden, he finishes a point off the second place. Still a good event for him. And Alice Lee with a nice win. We are going to take a final break. And when we return, we will have an interview for you with Sunil Weirmentry, the namesake of the Weirmentry Blitz. Stay tuned, everybody. And we are joined by Sunil Weirmentry, a mainstay, a champion of scholastic chess in the United States. Sunil, thank you so much for joining us and for helping put on this tournament. Oh, uh, thank you. It's great to be here, Robert and Katarina. It's nice to be here. Well, Sunil, let me ask you because you know this Blitz tournament is named after you. What's it like to see an event like this during such a difficult time be played out with so many excellent state champions? Oh, I enjoyed watching the event. It's been absolutely fantastic. And I believe it is Nico who won it, right? It was, yes, indeed. It was Nico. And, and, and that's uh, particularly gratifying because uh, I know him personally and he uh, comes from my neck of the woods and we've interacted a lot in the past. And he's a GM and it's, uh, it's awesome to have a GM actually playing in this tournament. So very pleased to uh, see that he won and, to, and for everybody who's joining and playing, yes. Um, it's somewhat embarrassing to have it named after me, though. Uh, Why? <laughs> no, actually, I'm deeply appreciative, and I'm, I'm <laughs> but I, I, I'm not sure exactly how I feel about it. You know, it's uh, you know, it's kind of overwhelming. You know, but uh, delighted to see that we were able to make it happen. Well, I think it's only fitting that a tournament is named in your honor, considering how much you've given to chess, and for some people. 
who are watching who may not be so familiar, why don't you tell everybody about your backstory and sort of you know what you've been doing to promote chess in the U.S. And you're quite a good player yourself, so don't sell yourself short there either. <laughs> no, I I think I'll keep my playing out of it, Robert. But um, but certainly you know I I've been devoting a lot of my uh, time to promoting scholastic chess and uh, trying to make it accessible to all kids. Uh, particularly you know when we took the decision a long time ago to to make scholastic chess school based because we felt like institutional support would make it more um, uh, more solid, they give it a more solid foundation. And um, and I think it, it was the right call, you know, as opposed to say doing it as youth chess to do it as a school based event so you would get even more support. And, and so I've been trying to, to work on that, you know, for a long time and uh, through the Scholastic Committee and the Scholastic Council and uh, USCF, so. So then I have a question. I yes. remember meeting you in Philadelphia and I actually didn't know you at that time, but I was taking their FIDE instructor coaching certificate or something like that. And you oh, were yes. giving us a lecture, which was absolutely fantastic. <laughs> I still remember it. And especially how you talked about kind of how to approach kids and clubs and how to teach them and especially how to balance when there is not enough female uh, players and if there is not enough girls and how to kind of um, make sure that girls feel included but not pressured to be responding questions. How do you feel now about USCF kind of working so much with uh, with girls and the USCF Women's Commission? Yeah, thank you, uh, Katrina. Yes, um, I, I think it's imperative to, um, you know, to make uh, girls feel inclusive and uh, to do whatever we can in that regard. Um, uh, one of the things we tried early, you know, I have been uh, doing the chess program at Hunter College Campus School since 1979. This is the 40th year and now the program has been institutionalized so it will survive me. But I remember one semester what we did was we separated the girls from math and chess. So chess is part of the curriculum. Um, and we separated the girls from math and chess and uh, just wanted to, uh, we wanted to see what, what it would be like. And it was rather interesting because um, the results were not what I expected. Certainly when it came to discussing positions and so forth, the girls were much more willing to join and you know, participated much more actively. And, and so from that perspective, it was very positive. But on the other hand, when it came to playing, there was a lot of socialization going on. <laughs> <laughs> and I just could not get them to play serious enough games. So from that point of view, it was a little disappointing. But but I think, you know, with the girls especially, we have to recognize this social aspect of it, you know, and, and that it is what drives a lot of girls to stay involved, and especially after a certain age. And if we take away that social aspect of it, you know, we will lose a lot of girls. So So that's something that we always have to remember. Perfect. Thank you. Speaking of something to always remember, I know many people know you as is, uh, Hikaru's stepfather, or you uh, raised him since he was a kid, but you mentioned the Hunter School. I'm from New York City. Can you remind people how many titles your team has won? I know you don't like to brag, but I'm sure you know the number. How many <laughs> oh, team goodness. titles? No, honestly, I, I don't know the exact number. I mean, I know generally how many titles I've won over the years. But one of the things I'll tell you is that one of the, um, uh, the titles we are most proud of at Hunter was winning the national high school championships three years in a row. The third year it was as co-champions with IS 118. So we didn't get a lot of recognition for that, but it was three years in a row. And that's very hard to do at a high school level because you're constantly turning over the chess population. So you have your good years and you have your bad years and so forth. But yes, we've won a lot of titles. But the main thing, Robert, is that we are competitive, you know. And uh, one of the things I try to instill in all the students is that we are a small community. And any of these breakdowns are sort of artificial. Hunter, Dalton. You, you went to Dalton, I believe. No, you went to Stuyvesant, right? Yes, Stuyvesant, yeah. No, so all these um, uh, breakdowns are sort of artificial and we, we need to come together more as a community. So it doesn't really matter whether you go to Hunter or Dalton or Stuyvesant. In the end, we are chess players and 
there's a larger community out there. So I try to make sure that the kids always treat the opponents with respect. And I think respect is the key word. And sometimes we lose sight of that because we get caught up in winning. And so um, I think that's an essential message uh, to inculcate in our students. I certainly agree. And I also remember when I was uh, much younger, Hunters hosted a number of weekend tournaments. So was that something that you, you know, helped institute because you thought that, as you said, it's not just about team events in the nationals and the city and state championships, but on the weekend, you can meet friends from other schools and help foster a love for the game of chess through friendship. Um, yeah, I, I seem to be um, uh, to be losing you for a moment there. I, I, I hope, am I still on? Uh, yeah, you're still here. Absolutely. Okay. Uh, yes, I started those tournaments, Robert, because, you know, uh, I wanted to create uh, good conditions for, uh, for scholastic events where uh, kids didn't always have to go and play with adults in regular tournaments. And, and I also believe in longer time controls. And I, I didn't like all the shorter time controls we are getting in scholastics. So uh, for that reason, uh, the only way to control that was to run your own tournament. So so we started the tournaments a while ago, and we used to get about 100 players, 150 players. And, and then, you know, the school opened up the whole school and made all the space available to me. And this last year, when we were still having tournaments, we were averaging 350 to 400 kids per tournament. Wow. It has really grown. Wow. Well, Katerina, so I, I need... want to say one more thing, if I may. Go for it. Um, yeah, uh, so I know the tournament is named after me. I don't want to create the wrong impression. I did not put up the money for this tournament. You know, um, it was done by uh, John Rockefeller, who is the one who's responsible for, you know, for you know, funding the tournament. I want to thank John very much for doing it and everybody who was involved with naming me. But I didn't want people to get the impression that I put up the money for the tournament. I think that's very important. And I also think it's important for us to acknowledge that, you know, you deserve the recognition. It was not your own choice. I think you've expressed to me and expressed to everybody that you're maybe not don't even want the, it to be named after you. However, it is. And it is a testament to how much you have given over the years to the game of chess. So we certainly show our deepest gratitude. Thank you. And I'll tell you one final story about Blitz, if I may. I mean, I believe that, you know, Blitz actually helps you get, get better. I, I, I grew up on a lot of Blitz myself, but when Hikaru was getting, you know, was coming up through the ranks, uh, sometimes I was criticized for letting him play too much Blitz because I was told that will hurt his game, you know, and maybe the best thing I did was not to stop <laughs> because I feel that if you are going to put a lot of time and energy into an activity, you also have to enjoy it and the kids enjoy blitz. So if you take away the enjoyment, how can you ask somebody to put in a lot of work? So that's basically why I didn't stop Hikaru. And I, but, but I feel you know, very strongly about that. I think you, know, you cannot take away the enjoyment. Wow. Uh, well, yeah. that's a very good point. Katerina, do you have any uh, final questions for Sunil before we uh, let him go? Um, I have a question and that is now Hikaru is doing so much Twitch and streaming. Uh, yes. Do you sometimes visit those streams? Oh, all the time. <laughs> you know, I, I find him entertaining. What can I say? <laughs> and uh, what I enjoy in particular is that he can uh, speak on any topic. Somebody in chat brings up something, he can speak about it and, and so forth. He will be streaming on Sunday, I, I believe, right? Um, yeah. He will be he will be doing the the invitation also very happy that he is going to be doing that for sure and well this moment as much as we love the car and appreciate him this moment definitely is about you Sunil. so we don't want people to forget that you're not Hikaru's stepfather to the chess community you are sort of the, one of the biggest influences in the united states in terms of scholastic chess and chess overall so we want to thank you once again for joining us and uh for this fantastic event which is in named in your honor Appreciate it. Thank you very much, both of you. Enjoyed it. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Well, that was Sunil Weirmentry, the namesake of this Weirmentry Blitz. As you know, it just came to conclusion with Nico Cheka winning the top section as a grandmaster.
someone from the New York area. And a reminder to everybody about the schedule coming up, the Denker and the Herring tournaments, they begin tomorrow, 11 a.m. Eastern time. The senior is at noon. There'll be three rounds of Denker and Herring on both Saturday and Sunday. The seniors, they have a more leisurely pace. They have one game tomorrow, one ga two games on Sunday. Then the following Saturday, August 1st, they have two games. And finally, their sixth and final game on August 2nd. So uh, it's going to be a very serious event in the sense that so many strong players They'll be proudly representing their states. And once more, we'd like to um, make a request that if you are able to, please feel free to donate. It's a tax deductible donation to the 501c3 U.S. Chess Federation. Support like yours makes events like these possible. And of course, we are greatly appreciative. And Katarina, on that note, the Blitz tournament is over with. Do you have any final thoughts of what we saw today and what we can look forward to this weekend and next? I think we saw a really fighting chess, what I actually expected. I think the players were excited to play. We saw also a number of kind of mistakes, blunders, which is normal for Blitz games. And I think we can expect the same tomorrow. We certainly can. And well, on that note, I do want to remind people of a couple of upcoming tournaments. We have the uh, online Olympiad, which begins in, I'm um, looking at the clock, about six hours from now. That is going to be a phenomenal event with 163 teams around the world taking part. And then we also will have uh, you know, the Pog Champs event coming up next month. But in, as it relates here, we have the Danker, the Barber, the Rockefeller, the Herring, and the Senior Championships. On that note, I mean, I've got nothing more. Katarina, it's been an absolute pleasure commentating with you. And we'll see everybody for more chess tomorrow. Thank you so much for tuning in.